Hello, warm greetings for, from UNDP Geneva, and welcome to this UNDP Development Dialogue event, Changemakers in Action, Cutting Edge Technologies for Disability Inclusive Early Warning and Preparedness. My name is Ioana Creitaru. I work for UNDP in Geneva, and I would like to share information about the event accessibility features today before we start. Please note, that there will be sign language available during the event. You can actually already see it on your screen. And we would like to ask you to stay on gallery view in order to follow this translation. In addition, there is also English to French interpretation, and you will find a button called interpretation below to access this translation. Please select your channel in order to hear the interpretation in French or in English. There will be also a Q&A session at the end of this event. We would really like to encourage everyone to type their questions and their reflections in the chat box. We have a very big audience today, and so we will not able to take all the questions verbally in the plenary. You have a team of facilitators on standby that monitors the um, questions as they are being posted, and we will try our best to address them during the event by asking our speakers and guest um, uh, invitees to address them. If you want to ask a specific question during the Q&A session that will happen at the end of the event, please raise your hand. You have this option in the bar below, and you will be given the floor by the moderator. We will try also to address all the questions from the floor. If your question is not being addressed live, please don't hesitate to drop it in the chat box. After the event, we will be preparing a summary, including the questions and answers. And so your question will definitely be addressed. Now, I would like to pass the floor to our moderator, Mr. Setareki Makanawi from the Pacific Disability Forum. Set up. Over to you now. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, good um, evening from uh, Fiji here in the Pacific, and uh, good morning to, um, or good afternoon to where you are in the world. And um, I do welcome all of you, welcome the, the, uh, all the participants. I welcome the invited speakers, a special guest to this uh, yet another UNDP development uh, dialogue series on the wonderful topic that uh, we are yet to unfold over the next two hours. The change makers in action, cutting edge technology for disability inclusive early warning and preparedness. As I said, this is taking place as part of the UNDP uh, the de development dialogue series. The purpose of this event is to raise the profile of the agenda of the of disability inclusive risk informed development and to provide a platform for exchange of innovative ideas on, on early warning technologies and last mile services addressing the specific requirements, needs of persons with disabilities to better manage risk and build resilience. There's a wide uh, stakeholder gather here in this event. And I must uh, thank uh, the organizers, again, UNDP and all its partners, uh, including the speakers and new participants, I believe to be over around 300 in total, uh, welcome. This event brings together a wide range of stakeholders, including persons with disabilities and their representative organizations, technology providers, global social media outlets, governments, academia, and UN agencies, and, de and international development partners. Now I will uh, 
uh, like us to uh, to hear from our keynote speakers by video. And I'll be asking for assistance here for the video to be played. We'll hear first from from Ms. Usha Ramanari is the Under Secretary General, the Associate Administrator of UNDP. Thank you. Disability inclusive. Early. Good morning. Welcome to the Development Dialogues on Change Makers in Action, Cutting Edge Technologies for Disability Inclusive Early Warning and Preparedness. My name is Usha Rao Manari, the Under Secretary General and Associate Administrator of the UNDP. It's now widely acknowledged that persons with disabilities who represent 15% of the world's population are disproportionately impacted by disasters, conflict and humanitarian crises. Yet, often the inclusion of persons with disabilities remains an under-prioritized or still emerging area of work. Acknowledging this truth, how can we do better to ensure that no one is left behind? This development dialogue aims to address these questions, but also go a step further we will attempt to illuminate what innovative solutions and partnerships already exist for disability inclusion, and then imagine what next generation cutting edge possibilities are on the horizon. Three years ago, the UNDP administrator, Achim Steiner, gave the keynote address at the Global Disability Summit, co-hosted by the governments of Kenya, the United Kingdom, and the International Disability Alliance. The administrator stressed that at UNDP, we firmly believe to achieve progress on the SDGs, disability inclusion cannot be approached as a standalone issue, but rather needs to be promoted across all policies and programs. Some of the examples he highlighted included working together with organizations of persons with disabilities to support implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, as well as developing government-wide inclusive legal frameworks and policies in places such as Albania and Liberia. He also emphasized the importance of pursuing innovative solutions such as in Georgia, where along with persons with disabilities, UNDP co-designed an innovative system to ensure equal access to life-saving emergency services. Going forward, we hope to foster even more partnerships and co-create many more innovative solutions and this session aims to be a springboard for that. Joining us today are distinguished representatives from the disability community, private sector, government, humanitarian and development organizations who will all play a key part in developing disability inclusive early warning and preparedness solutions to better manage risk and resilience. Thank you very much and I look forward to the session. Thank you. Um, we'll now have our second uh, speaker also by video. He's the Director, Bureau for Policy and Program Support, Mr. Haoliang Zhu. Can you have the video, please? Dear colleagues, Welcome to this exciting development dialogue. My name is Hao Liang Xu, and I'm UNDP Director of the Bureau for Policy and the Program Support. Persons with disabilities are disproportionately affected by climate change and disaster impacts, and yet are often not included in disaster and crisis prevention, response, and recovery. The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced the need to address the underlying risk drivers, reduce poverty, and eradicate inequalities, all of which further fragilize communities and countries in the face of crisis. While technology alone cannot solve everything, innovative and inclusive solutions by and for persons with disabilities are imperative. During this development dialogue, we will discuss cutting edge technologies to co-create early warning and preparedness solutions 
which are inclusive and accessible to persons with diverse disabilities. UNDP already has experience on these issues, including collaborating with the governments of Armenia, whose representative is with us today, on a crowdsourced map application that indicates locations of physical accessibility to persons with disabilities across the country. This illustrates how UNDP supports the implementation of the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We are guided in our work on disability inclusion by the principles of the UNDP guidance note on disability inclusive development. And we do so from a position of humility, knowing well that we don't have all the answers, which is why you all are here. Today's session itself is as inclusive as we can be in a virtual format, including simultaneous sign language interpretation and the live captioning. In this way, we're doing our best to walk the talk, understanding that while the future may be uncertain, it has to be, however, most certainly inclusive. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Osha uh, Manari, and also Mr. Zhu for your excellent um, uh, words in um, introducing uh, and opening this. Uh, this. Now, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, uh, we will now venture into a a set of questions uh, where we'll be inviting our our various speakers to respond to each question and uh, again reminding our speakers um, uh, you have uh, five minutes uh, to be uh, making your, your, your presentation um, firstly i will want to ask uh, uh, miss jenny caswell uh, research and inside director uh, mobile for human Mentor innovation from GMSA uh, to address the first question. And the first question is, how can a human-centered design be applied to identify solutions by and for persons with disabilities? Uh, Jenny, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and, and thanks very much for inviting GSMA to share experiences today. I think that most people joining this session today would probably agree that technology and digital services present a significant opportunity for disability inclusive disaster risk reduction and humanitarian action. But digital tools can also be a major barrier if they're not designed appropriately and can risk exacerbating existing inequalities, particularly for people with disabilities. And so their success is going to depend on who gets to define the problem and build the solution. So in our Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation program at the GSMA, which is funded by UK Aid, we've been working with our mobile operator members, our humanitarian partners, but most importantly, end users to ensure inclusive digital humanitarian assistance. We know really well, particularly with the experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic, that when people living with a disability are not adequately included in the planning process, they can face restricted access to potentially life-saving information and services. And so to address the, these challenges, one of the first things that we've done in our program is to start quantifying the mobile disability gap in humanitarian settings by using the Washington Group questions. And we've sized this gap working with UNHCR in three refugee contexts to try and move beyond anecdotal information and offer really robust data on how much less likely a person with disabilities is to own or access a mobile phone than a person without. So although data is a really critical first step, it's of course only part of the solution. And we need deeper insights from end users themselves on how to create inclusive digital services. And so this is where we find human-centered design comes in. 
we've used human-centered design or HCD approaches to address this challenge by co-creating mobile enabled services with users at the center of the proce process, together with mobile operators and humanitarian organizations in partnership. And I'm gonna share a few of our examples that we've learned along the way. So firstly, what is human-centered design? In its simplest terms, it's a practical and iterative methodology for problem solving. And the premise is really simple in that people closest to the problem have a lot of contextual intelligence and knowledge. And HCD allows for us to center those people in the process of creating solutions. So using participative HCD methods, we found can be particularly useful for marginalized groups because they often face intersecting challenges that are hard to uncover through other methods. Take the refugee disability intersect as an example. We found in a recent study in Kenya where we used human centered design to better understand people's lived realities and relationships with mobile technology that for people with visual or hearing impairments, it's already hard to navigate a health system. Then add to that that you're a refugee and you don't know what service you're entitled to in the host country and your challenges are even more accentuated. So it's these kinds of complex challenges that we find are best uncovered through qualitative approaches using methods that really pull out people's first person perspectives. The other great thing that we found about human centered design tools is that they're malleable and so they can be adapted to fit different user group needs. When running some of these workshops in Kenya, working with a design agency Butterfly Works, we used a variety of mediums and materials to suit users' needs and preferences. So for example, when creating communication maps, which help to understand people's communication landscapes, we ensured that tactile objects like clay and small figurines were available for participants with visual impairments to use. And we also find that putting users at the center doesn't just uncover problems, but HCD really, has a really strong focus on creative and collaborative problems problem solving. So one method we used was a user journey exercise, sorry, a user, yeah, user journey exercise, which enabled users to document the steps taken in accessing services. So first we did this to understand challenges faced, and then for people to imagine how they would have wanted the experience to look, problem solving together to find solutions. So through this pro project, we found that research participants, especially the hearing impaired, face challenges in communicating, particularly with service providers like health professionals or mobile money agents. And because not everyone can use sign language and many mobile services are voice based, like call centers, participants felt particularly marginalized. So we worked with end users and UNHCR and Safaricom through the entire research process in Kenya, creating accessible alternatives, such as the provision of video relay for UNHCR and Safaricom call centers as a service for the hearing impaired. And we also work to increase awareness of existing ex assistive technologies like M-Pesa Voice. M-Pesa is the mobile money banking platform in Kenya, which enables visually impaired people to interact with MPESA through interactive voice command technology. So we published the various human centered design tools so that they can be applied by humanitarian and tech providers to improve inclusive DRR approaches. So ultimately, we believe that it's only by having better data and co-defining challenges and solutions for persons with disabilities that will ensure digital and protection for all. I think my time's up, but hopefully I've answered your question. I'm delighted to be here today and listen to the reflections from the other panelists. Thank you, over to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Ms. Keswell. Uh, uh, also still on question one, and um, I also get just a reminder for those who want uh, Sign language interpretation, international sign is available. Uh, French and English translation is also available. Please make sure you're on that right uh, uh, platform. Uh, question and answers, please do ask a question in the chat box that will be attended to uh, by, by um, our colleagues. Now we will invite uh, Ms. Amin, and I will um, apologize in adv advance if I butchered your second name, Ms. Amin. Uh, Repetian. It was a Sendai uh, framework focal point, uh, Sendai framework focal point, uh, Ministry of Emergency Situation, Government of, of, of Armenia. 
uh, I now give you the floor, Madam. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, introdu introducing me. I know my second name is very hard to pronounce. Uh, dear participants, it's an honor to be present here uh, at these development dialogues, and I will be speaking as a Sendai National Focal Point on, on these uh, perspectives and on the issues that we are raising during this discussion. The Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction is one of the most important international frameworks, emphasizing the all of the society commitment and recognizing persons with disabilities as one of the key stakeholders in DRR. It encourages member states to engage persons with disabilities and their representative organizations as assessment of disaster risk uh, in, in, in assessment of disaster risk and in designing and implementing DRR programs. Despite the progress made in disability inclusive DRR, the gaps still remain at various levels. For example, early warning systems and disaster preparedness measures often remain inaccessible to persons with diverse disabilities. There is also a lack of support system to persons with disabilities before, during and after disasters that would enable them to participate effectively in disaster risk reduction efforts and to be able to evacuate timely and safely in case of a disaster. Hence, persons with disabilities remain, as it was already said, disproportionately affected by disasters, often due to the environmental, institutional and attitudinal barriers that they face. Then a question raises, what are the key barriers to the effective design and implementation of disability inclusive DRR policies and programs and how we can do better? One of the answers lies in the first guiding principle of the Sendai framework, understanding risk, which can be accomplished by collecting internationally comparable data disaggregated by disability. Organizations of persons with disabilities can play an important role with, in this regard, as they are often most reliable sources for the identification of persons with disabilities in the most marginalized communities. Applying human-centered design is also an important um, for is also important for identification of solutions by and for persons with disabilities. Relevant technologies and adaptation of the existing tools can be successfully tested while working closely with persons with disabilities and organizations of persons with disabilities as co-designers of such technologies. There are already some uh, there are already some examples of successful partnerships and efforts in this regard. However, a lot more still needs to be done. Disability advocates and the organizations of persons with disabilities can play a significant role for disability inclusive interventions. However, disaster management agencies and DRR practitioners still tend to have limited interaction on collaboration with them. So what we can and probably must do as governmental, non-governmental and international organizations is to engage with persons with disabilities. Alors il faut donc euh, s'engager avec les personnes euh, okay, handicapées. I, I have the interpretation uh, in the main. I so, I'm sorry. Is to engage with persons with disabilities. And donc il faut s'engager avec les personnes qui euh, in a more dialogue to make their specific requirements dans un, dans un, un dialogue beaucoup plus actif more practical and applicable solutions secondly however for creating an enabling environment for participation we may need to consider providing adequate support systems to persons with disabilities for example the ministry of emergency situations of the republic of armenia has created a mechanism for engaging persons with disabilities in drr activities in a number of ways for instance persons with disabilities have been appointed to relevant positions in the crisis management national center dealing with the emergency call center responses and coordination they are affiliated as experts with less working hours than the shift members with no disabilities and are also provided with the means of accessible transportation to work by the ministry. At the same time, the ministry has taken special measures to take amendments in legislation concerning the service in the rescue forces, which didn't allow persons with any type of disabilities to be recruited in the rescue forces until two months ago. We have been also doing our best to work with persons with disabilities as equal contributors to the DRR planning and programming at all levels. In fact, 
all of the technical innovations, cutting edge solutions and efforts towards inclusion of persons with disabilities in ERR and emergency response will be more effective and valuable when the specific requirements of persons with diverse disabilities while addressing the key barriers to inclusion are taken into consideration. And the most effective way to do so is to work closely with persons with disabilities and their representative organizations who bring the lived experience and very much needed experience uh, on disability inclusion to the DRR community at large. I thank you very much for your attention and looking forward for a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Amin, and um, again, sharing the government uh, perspective, the government of Armenia. Uh, this question one, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll now move to question two. Uh, we have uh, uh, two speakers on this question, for this question two. Now I will invite uh, as first speaker, uh, uh, is Dr. Charudatta Jada uh, from the Center of Excellence Research and Innovation Unit at Tata Consultancy Services to reflect on question Thanks. two. Uh, the question two is, what are the most relevant cutting edge technology from, from a provider perspective, reflecting on the opportunity and challenges on co-creating, piloting and scaling up solutions Disability inclusive early warning preparedness. preparedness. Over the floor to you, uh, Dr. Chadata. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor uh, uh, to be part of uh, this wonderful event and share uh, some of our research work in this particular space. Uh, so we, um, uh, uh, so how technology could uh, could uh, ensure that you know we uh, come up with a solution which is a human centric and also practically. Uh, 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 complement the existing systems uh, system. So, so before explaining the, the the two research which we have done and the the solutions which we have come up with, um, we have conducted an user research uh, uh, to identify the challenges faced by people with disability in the um, in this uh, disaster management uh, and the entire process from alert to uh, to provide them guidance, tracking, and taking them to the safety zone and provide additional uh, additional support. Uh, the, the key challenges which, which um, you know, we, we observed uh, or the findings of this research was that, that every stage of the, the process, there is an accommodation and, and consultation is required, uh, 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 keeping in mind the, the functional limitations of person with disabilities. They come from the background where, where the literacy rate is low. The way we need to communicate and, the, and alert them is, 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 is very, very important. It's also important that you know they may not be able to get into a safety zone on their own, uh, so we need uh, need uh, some additional mechanisms to uh, to ensure that uh, the the proactive supports provided uh, to them. Uh, the the government bodies, the the, the team of people with dis the, the disaster management will, with the limited resources, tracking each individual is a, is a challenge, and therefore uh, an innovative processes and innovative approach required. We ensure that uh, um, we take care of each and every individual, and provide provide uh, provide them, uh, them them the support. And the 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 last and important one is that you know they are due to power supply that you know all traditional way of communication may may not work, and therefore we need to also take care of uh, 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 those aspects. So uh, so to come to the solution quickly. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 we have taken an up to a systems approach where the, 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 the solution could integrate with an existing disaster management system. It could be an inclusive, so there is no dedicated solution required for people with disability because sustaining, maintaining those will be challenged. Uh, the, uh, the approach should be technology plus process innovation. Inclusive thinking is required where we could take care of uh, the, the specific needs of people with disabilities. And uh, the uh, the uh, it should take care of the indoor uh, uh, environment and uh, and external environment uh, with uh, you know pre uh, uh, emergency situation and during emergency situation. So quickly, how the solution works. So the first component of the solution is an is an, an uh, uh, disaster um, alert uh, uh, engine, uh, which is an mobile client resides on SIM. 
uh, SIM card. So, it, uh, so we had uh, developed this with using the API kits of SIM. So it works on any mobile device. Uh, it's a feature phone, smartphone. Uh, so there is no uh, that, uh, the problem of, uh, with that. And uh, the, the, the process works this way, that it is the, the alert generated by the central system by uh, at server, the, uh, the, the alert reach out to, the, uh, to, to, to the, the respective mobile device. Mobile device, this application gets invoked and it takes complete control of mobile device. And uh, it provides the, uh, the, the alert. There are multiple ways of providing alert to keep taking care of different types of people with disabilities. So alerts are um, uh, in, in, uh, in text, and audio, um, um, audio where um, uh, the, uh, the the native language communications has been given. Uh, the, uh, the the alert also has been and be generated with an and severe vibrations, uh, 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 awning the uh, the flashlight of the camera. Uh, the, the alert also will be will be uh, will be given. The message also will be given with a screenshot. An important consideration here: what we have done is. Uh, after the the alert generated, we have gen uh, we have come up with a key um, um, uh, one key special key where we accept the confirmation of the, the alert received by 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 an person, and then we start tracking that person uh, with the tracking module. Uh, uh, the the nearby uh, 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 people gets alert that there is a person with disability who needs need support. The government bodies uh, uh, gets the information the 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 know of that person. And the 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 uh, the, the guide, guidance has been provided, and he has taken to the uh, to the uh, to the to the safety zone. Uh, the, the in the indoor environment, the detect underlying technology has been has been changed uh, uh, with an uh, uh, instead of a SIM application, it's a mobile application, but uh, uh, it's an AR application. So we track the user, uh, the, the person with uh, the the the, uh, the the AR technology, and provide this multimodal uh, alert systems. Uh, 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 generate the path uh, using the indoor uh, positioning system and help him to 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 get him ev evacuated from the indoor uh, environment uh, quickly with uh, the the defined uh, defined path. The the uh, the uh, the people with civic bodies, people with disaster managements are able to locate uh, the 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 each and indi uh, every individual through their tracking system. They they are aware about the personas, their disabilities. Uh, so the the right kind of messages, right kind of uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the guidance has been provided, and the 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 system also basically generate the alerts nearby uh, people, so the the, uh, the 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 nearby people could reach out and you know provide the the system. So in a nutshell, it's a hybrid solution where uh, the the uh, the sim based application will be normally in the natural calamities uh, could be utilized. Uh, where the area could be uh, much larger, and the uh, the uh, in, in in specific environment, which is a uh, you know in a building environment kind of thing, the situations could be handled differently. And there is a server component which basically integrate with a disaster management system, where the the access is been given to the government bodies, the police, uh, the civic authorities, and the alert. Uh, the, the false alerts did not be get generated. So there are there are uh, so there, there are mechanisms has been created to ensure. That the, the cross verification, cross validations has been done. The, the the alerts has been generated at right locations, and the communications uh, has been gone. And the coordination of all these bodies, uh, bodies, and the the last mile um, uh, uh, support uh, 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 and safety is been provided uh, uh, through this tracking ma can mechanism and multimodal. Can you run so this up your this presentation, please? Thank sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. A receipt alert from the server and access application will be invoked that will generate the change papers and action colon cutting dashes. Thank you very much. Uh, so sorry to uh, cut you off there. I'm sure there will be uh, time for question and answers at the end of this session. Sure. Thank you. Now we will turn to our still on question. We will now invite uh, uh, Mr. Bimal Portal. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bimal is from the, the project coordinator. Uh, the National Federation of Disabled in Nepal. Uh, and he's going to speak uh, from the perspective of uh, National Disabled Persons, Organization of Persons with Disabilities, OPD. Uh, and also he will be uh, introducing a colleague uh, uh, from uh, his organization uh, from a local uh, district level uh, to share that video. Over to you, Bimal. The floor is yours. 
Thank you so much uh, uh, for moderator and organizer uh, for this opportunity. This is me, Bibal Powdell, serving as National Project Coordinator in National Federation of Disabled Nepal. Uh, regarding cutting edge technology, uh, there are so many options available throughout the globe. However, mm -hmm. the first and foremost and even critical question, are they really accessible, affordable, and even feasible to particular communities. Here, I want to share some of them, including the aspects of inclusion. The very first stage that would be the knowledge of risks or stage of assessment. Uh, the very uh, crucial point is whether you have just used the process, assessment processes, tools, techniques, and even database which is inclusive of all, including persons with disabilities. Regarding dissemination and communication of warnings, mobile SMS, uh, specifically for mass population and smoke or uh, earthquake detector, specifically for indoor purposes are uh, some of the good examples with multiple features. Moreover, a uh, web-based uh, uh, forecast system and multimedia, uh, mass media and social media messages in multiple methods with multiple features are might be also a few other uh, excellent examples regarding the dissemination of warnings. What you have to question yourself, are they really available in multiple formats or used in with uh, multiple form, uh, features. For instance, can only the mobile text message without any voice and any other feature address the specific needs of people with diverse abilities and disabilities? How do you build on the specific needs, capacities, and even the ownership of particular co uh, communities and societies? Moreover, how do you, uh, how much do you invest on strengthening lead and lab timing for particular people, those who are at risk? Or have you paid attention at least to strengthen or make the accessible routes towards the safer places so that those early warning systems based on technology can lead properly to the success? At this point, the engagement and the meaningful participation of persons with disabilities and their organization, OPDs, would be quite critical and imperative. Generally, those people are not considered uh, uh, as the active person, rather they are considered as the rec uh, passive recipient of an, uh, different benefits and services uh, before, during, and uh, after the emergency situation. Uh, but if you can get the engagement and active participation of those OPDs, definitely the, the vulnerability and the barriers can properly be visualized. Uh, for instance, what happened if any systems, documents, documentaries, or web pages produced by any development agencies or government organizations which are talking a lot and even committed for the inclusion of persons with disabilities. However, they themselves are not produced in, in, uh, in accessible or inclusive ways. That's why I generally prefer to say uh, it as accessibility paradox. That's why you have to think and rethink on that so that the any system would not be excluded no um, uh, anyone even you are talking uh, to ensure the inclusion of those particular population that's why with the engagement of opds you can get the in user like um, um, references and even or the feedback from the um, process of user testing uh, even the inclusive workplace can lead to the 
more concrete achievements that we have experienced a lot in our context. Uh, at, at the end, uh, um, uh, I would like to request you to think and rethink with few questions. To what extent and how have those OPDs been engaged during the different stages or all stages of creating early warning system or disaster preparedness? Or are they really being trained or habituated on using such kind of systems or so that such system can lead to the success. Now I want to uh, uh, present a case from Dang district. In the recorded video, Mr. Chintamadi Paudel, as a representative of Organization of Persons with Disability in Dang district, will be presenting his experience at local level. Thank you so much. Here you go. Namaste to all. I am sharing my experience here. My organization advocates at local level for the rights and entitlements of persons with disabilities. Our working area is at the high risk of flood, landslide, fire, and earthquake. So we collaborate and intervene with government authorities, NGOs, and community people for disability inclusive response, recovery, and preparedness activities. We have been engaged during the assessment and planning process. We also represent and contribute to different committees, including the early warning committee at community level. Our community has also prepared an evacuation center. We also contributed, making it accessible for persons with different impairment types as well. However, so many physical infrastructures and communication services are not accessible for us. Consequently, we are not able to contribute to the greater extent. Moreover, persons with intellectual disability, autism, psychosocial disability, and deaf blindness have rarely been engaged in such initiatives. Community people are reluctant to make them engaged, considering it, considering it as the waste of time. Warning SMS has now been circulated to the mobile phones in few places. However, it does not have the pictorial and audible contents. Siren or drum has also been used, but such a single option would not be relevant for all. DRR portals are hardly used at community level. Local emergency unit also immediately circulates the warning messages using the community volunteers. However, the small number of such people would not be sufficient, providing supports for all. Safer places are at far distance, so people with mobility limitations can't escape within short period of time because of geographical remoteness and unavailability of vehicle and other options. Therefore, proper information should be collected prior to any disaster. Improvements on physical infrastructures and communication services are needed. Persons with disability and their family members should properly be trained. Thank you so much. And your constructive feedback and any queries would be highly appreciated. Off to you. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful sharing. Um, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, participants, uh, we have um, uh, done two questions. Now we'll move to question three. And now I will invite uh, Ms. Mihoko Sakurai from the Center for Global Communication 
in the International University of Japan to reflect on question three. And the question is, how can communication technology and social media be used to deliver last mile services so that early warning and risk information reached everyone? The floor is your, yours, uh, Ms. Sakurai. Thank you. Thank you for introduction. And uh, hello, all of you. My name is Mihoko Sakurai. I'm working for the International University of Japan. Thank you for having me today. I've been working with local municipalities for around 10 years, studying how they could be more resilient. One of our research topics is early warning and risk information delivery from local municipalities to citizens, including at risk groups, and how to utilize information technologies in doing so. Mobile devices and social media are widely used in order to deliver those information. In Japan, we have a national warning information delivery system via our smartphone. Once the Japan Meteorological Agency detects an indication of an earthquake or flooding, they send an alert message to our smartphone. This is automatically delivered. This system is used for local municipalities evacuation orders as well. Such an alert message is delivered by text with illustration and audio. It can be translated into several foreign languages as well. What we are discussing right now is how a municipal government could deliver personalized information under consideration of each person's situation. So current practice of warning and risk information delivery is based on geographical area division. It means a large information and evacuation order is determined by physical address of citizens and messages are all the same. But we know each person has their own context and also their own risk. So we expect digital technology as well as social media to deliver optimized risk information per individual situation. For instance, it enables delivery of your evacuation route or your evacuation place and so on. We also know that such technologies wouldn't be functioned without people around. In that sense, we think a local community is the most important in delivering life-saving information to those who are at risk groups. A local, community, a lo local municipality that I'm working with, they possess a name list of person at risk groups and also a person who helps them in time of an emergency. A local municipality tries to form a small community of them and train them how to receive and understand life-saving information delivered by different authorities. Here, when creating a local community, our challenge is personal information sharing. I've heard of a story about a mother who has a daughter with a disability. She said, even I hesitate to provide my daughter's personal information to male staff in the local government. This is more a psychological issue rather than technology itself. But we think we need to understand such problems when thinking about the community and the use of technology for future disaster risk reduction. That is all my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Miyoko-san. 
Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow participants, uh, and, and invited guests, of course. Um, our topic, of course, as we know, just want to remind us, change makers in action. And I'm sure you are hearing some uh, very useful information on how we can be change makers in action, cutting edge technology for disability inclusive development, early warning and preparedness. Now for the third question, to hear from the perspective of regional organizations of persons with disabilities, I will now invite uh, Mr. Josko Wakanyasi, uh, a colleague of mine at the Pacific Disability Forum, the manager for inclusive development, uh, to reflect on question three that we are on from a regional DPO perspective. How can communication technology and social media be used to deliver last mile services so that early warning and risk information reached everyone? Uh, Mr. Wakanyasi, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Watanawai. Um, thank you, colleagues. Uh, and appreciate it. Thank you to uh, the earlier presenters. Um, one of the big questions that uh, within the region is on one, one part, you have the technology device in itself. And this is whether it be through mobile phones or through laptops, the, the hardware. Often is that the challenge to reach the last mile, especially for regions like the Pacific, is connectivity. The reliant on connectivity to ensure that the message that is being portrayed is actually delivered on time. And it gets to people on time considering the person's disability and your target population. So one of the questions we've always been asking in terms as far as the region is concerned in the reaching of the last mile is when do this information actually go out? When do they actually receive the information? Um, one of the concepts that's often being used uh, in the region in the use of technology to actually deliver and using social media platforms for most OPDs in the Pacific region, they receive the message first hand through formal forms of media. And this is through the government platforms, through the national disaster management organizations that are established in countries. Then the OPDs then take this information and then disseminate to their members, to their target population, using social media platforms that they've created. They've also created their own networks of groups and they use either Facebook accounts that they have, uh, they use um, their, their own Viber uh, programs and platforms in order to relay uh, these crucial messages. Because at the moment, the gaps that is within the current systems is that they're often text plus. Everybody receives the same, the same message. But then for many persons with disability, this message needs to be broken down further. For example, for those with hearing impairment, they have their own form of receiving and disseminating messages. The social media platform that is being used and use the use of technology is not only to relay a message, but also to gather message. So the point of contact with OPDs is crucial in terms of innovation going forward and the appropriate use of technology. And how can we best appropriately use technology? Sadly, is that most of the concentration on how to ensure inclusiveness of persons with disability in the modern era of technology is at national level. How do you disseminate the information? How to best ensure that you reach the last mile in terms of information that is being given out? But receiving information and the support system that is then needed in between is heavily reliant on the OPDs. Yet sadly is that in many cases, when creating such systems, the OPDs are often used as a tick the box, dot the I's, cross the T's. The consultation with the OPDs is only in often in the early stages. And this is asking them question or questionnaire is often sent out. And then once the questions are answered, the items, the creation of the programs is then produced. Over time, and in the last uh, five, six years, there's been better engagement in terms of how the OPDs within the Pacific region are communicating with their national disaster, um, national disaster organizations that be, has been established by governments. But most of it is on person to person and the political will and the commitment 
by those that are actually implementing these national bodies. So the social media platform that is being used and to encourage persons with disabilities engagement is still currently heavily reliant on social medias. And mostly these are done, as I mentioned, through Facebook. Most of these communications in terms of one, one another. And sometimes this can be misleading is because the person who's sending the message can misinterpret the message or miscommunicate a message that is coming through because you are reliant on third, fourth, even in some cases, fourth, fourth hand stories. As uh, Miyoko has mentioned uh, from Japan in um, the, just the statement just before this is setting up groups. Those are formal setting groups. The lived experience of persons with disability is crucial to be part of the trial of the, the um, when innovating or when you're creating something. A person with disability is crucial to be in the center of how it's created, how it's trained, and for how long. And what is the change that needs to be developed? What changes needs to happen to the technology space to ensure that the end user actually can say that this is applicable for me? Because one, you're going to take into context and consideration also the type of disability or the impairment of the individual. This is also crucial in the design. For most Pacific Island countries is that the OPDs, their representative organizations can provide and being provided support by regional organizations such as Pacific Disability Forum to provide the technical oh, yeah. support to these OPDs to get them engaged in this. So the way forward um, from a regional perspective here within the Pacific region, take into consideration one, the, the challenges of connectivity, the challenges of um, economic um, hardships that persons with disability actually face is because if you look at technology devices, the more advanced the device, the more expensive the device. And often there's often competing priorities. So how can we can ensure, and that is a question, um, uh, companies and backgrounds, how can we ensure that technology that is being created is also affordable by persons with disability and how appropriate can they be? Thank you so much for listening, Vinata. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh... Mr. Wakaniasi for sharing the experience from the Pacific. Uh, now for our um, uh, speaker to respond to the fourth question uh, before we head to, um, to our special guests and then invite questions from the floor. Um, from the participants, please have a questions ready. Some very interesting um, topics, uh, discussions are going on. I will now invite uh, Miss Selina Moirod, uh, forgive me if I've uh, butchered the second name, ma'am. Uh, UNDP resident representative for Lebanon uh, to respond to this question. What are some of the UNDP takeaways in terms of including persons with disabilities and their rep representative organizations in developing development initiatives? whether it be focused on prevention, preparedness, or recovery. Ms. Celine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, dialogue. And, um, and I will, uh, like my colleague said before, I will speak humbly from the perspective of uh, Lebanon, where I'm currently uh, uh, located. So I, I, I just want to maybe highlight a, a, few, a few issues. Um, and that will speak uh, primarily from, from my recent uh, experience uh, in Lebanon uh, in the context of the uh, post uh, 4th of August uh, blast explosion um, in the port, uh, as well as the work that, uh, uh, as well as a reflection on, on the issues of disaster risk management and disaster preparedness in, in the country. So, I, I mean, I, I think a few, a, a few points uh, from my perspective as, uh, as the head of UNDP in Lebanon. Um, 
First, and this is, I think, what has driven our uh, engagement in the post-blast response, I think uh, we need to, as, as a United Nation and as a UNDP, we need to go back to uh, leaving no one behind. I, I know it seems a bit obvious, but I think uh, in the context of the post-blast, uh, for us, this was a starting point. There was a lot of conversation and focused on physical uh, uh, reconstruction. Um, our focus was also we need to put people uh, in the middle of that uh, recovery process, and that includes, uh, among others, uh, uh, persons with uh, disabilities. Um, second, um, I think, and I just, I think some of the, the participants uh, said it before me, um, the importance of uh, working and engaging uh, um, um, organizations uh, that works on issues of disability and disability advocates. I mean, we are privileged in Lebanon to have a regional goodwill ambassador for climate change uh, who is called Michael Haddad. He is also an advocate uh, for inclusion that is Lebanese himself and basically really has carried uh, in Lebanon the issue of inclusion um, and, uh, um, and disability inclusive recovery for the port of Beirut, uh, which is on the one hand, raising the, the issue. I think uh, sometimes we take for granted that this is prioritized, it's not always the case. And also uh, advocating, advocating with, uh, with government, but also advocating for donors that the type of recovery we see in Lebanon is, is inclusive. Um, and that covers many of the issues that uh, uh, the panelists before me has, has, have, uh, have highlighted, including the issue of uh, accessibility. Uh, you know, when a lot of financing will actually go towards uh, physical reconstruction, this cannot be a, an afterthought. Um, uh, two other points. Um, I think as UNDP, if we are uh, really committed to uh, working on, on this issue, I think it's about connecting uh, recovery with uh, more structural uh, issues and issues of uh, of inclusion uh, that uh, uh, is faced in, in the country. Uh, so it means working on the our normative and human rights agenda uh, issues of uh, whether countries, if, like for in Lebanon, sign and ratify the uh, UN conventions on the rights of persons with disabilities, and also are looking at the implementation of uh, specific laws in Lebanon. Um, we have uh, specific laws, but they have not been implemented. So I think it's also connecting those agendas because they need to be part of an integrated agenda. And then finally, um, I mean, connecting to a lot of what uh, the guest speakers have said before, I hope that uh, in Lebanon there is an opportunity to revisit this disaster risk management um, framework that is in place. I mean, um, you know, this is driven through many type of risk that the country faces. It. Uh, I think in the context of post-COVID and the blast, there will all hopefully be opportunities for uh, review viewing the frameworks and bringing the voices of many groups that haven't been, in my view, uh, uh, fully uh, in included. And then addressing many of the issues that have been raised in terms of uh, data, in terms of uh, engagement, in terms of early warning, and also in terms of uh, response. So thank you for, for having me. And really, I think a lot of uh, very useful points that I will take back to Lebanon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that concludes our uh, panel discussion on uh, this topic, uh, change makers in action. And you heard a lot of this, as I said earlier, cutting edge technology for disability inclusive, early warning and preparedness. Uh, we will be, um, uh, we'll turn the, the, the floor now to our, invited uh, uh, guest speakers. There were some special guests that were invited and I'll be asking them, uh, Joanna can, will be helping me out here. Uh, those um, invited special guests, if you can, if you want to speak, please uh, raise your hand uh, and Joanna will uh, alert me to her who wants to speak. But uh, on your behalf, on our behalf, on behalf of the UNDP uh, Development Dialogue Series, the organizers thank the panelists once again for that wealth of information, uh, some uh, innovative, innovative, some challenging uh, to, to, to help us address the topic that we are dealing with today. And I look forward to those questions uh, on the chat box. Uh, you will be, your question will be answered by uh, the organizers that are looking at the chat box. Uh, and after this uh, special guests, 
that I'll give the floor to now. We will then invite uh, questions uh, uh, from the audience. Joanna, any take for the moment from the special invited guests? I believe we have a question by Atif Sher. Okay, I'll give the floor now to Mr. Atif Tishi uh, from Pakistan. The floor is yours, uh, my friend. Uh, hello, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's been listening to this very important uh, uh, discussion, dialogue. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me very clearly, and I would try to speak uh, slowly so that the sign language interpreters and other uh, language interpreters can <clears throat> have, may not have any problem to translate what I'm seeing. And most of the discussion uh, like by eminent panelists, experienced people we have heard covered almost everything. Just a couple of points. I'll mention here are, uh, first of all, uh, the Cutting edge, when we talk about cutting edge technology uh, adopted by DRR stakeholders mainly or <clears throat> DRR management uh, bodies all over the world, most of the uh, technologies, a uh, technology is basically an, an ecosystem which in, includes the devices, gadgets, and their implementation mechanism. So in most of the countries, uh, we we are in developing countries. Uh, we are lacking having these devices, gadgets, or this ecosystem of cutting edge technology. But <clears throat> where, where, wherever we have these, uh, they still need to be inclusive. For example, early warning systems and all over the world, like they are, most of them are accessible now. But still, we need to. Uh, have some kind of a research that how to make it inclusive for all kinds of disabilities, all kinds of people, not only people with disabilities, but all, all uh, uh, for those people who are illiterate, who can't read and write. So we need to make it also inclusive for persons with uh, uh, intellectual disabilities. So we have to make all these early warning systems accessible. Plus, uh, during the emergency responses, the gadgets and the transportation system and the mechanism which is being adopted, the high-tech technology, cutting cutting edge technologies are available, but uh, these technologies need to be re reconsidered as accessible for everyone in terms of mobility as well. Plus, uh, and the second point, which is uh, which I need to mention. Ati Atif, uh, if you can. Uh... Make your last point, and then we'll go to the next speaker. Thank sure, you. sure. This is my last point. And uh, person with disabilities and their organizations, they need to be consulted by the DRR management body and the decision makers so that they can get the first-hand information from them. Thank you, Sheta. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak from the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Atif. Um... I believe uh, Mr. Anil Pokhral also would like to take the floor. Uh, these are from our special guests. If you're ready, uh, Mr. Pokhral, you have three minutes. Thank you. I believe, I'm sorry, I see Della Leonor who wanted to take the floor. Is it okay? Well, thank you, everyone. My name is Dalil Yunar. I'm from the Asian. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Dalil Yunar from the Asian Disability Forum. Um, we have been doing so much with the uh, DRR in different types of the world, but nevertheless, uh, the participation of persons with disability is not really augmented. Uh, is there a way that we can do our research 
uh, having persons with disability in the process of DRR so that we will be able to create a guide manual or a certain way of making these things uh, available for our stakeholders, the government, the national and the local, because the implementation of the DRR would always uh, remain um, not useful if we don't do something like we don't really push it to the limit because every time there's a calamity, we are always left behind and we don't want that to happen again. So maybe we will gather always um, researchers, uh, all the, the knowledge from all the uh, contributors of this forum and maybe we can create a certain um, coalition of people who would be able to, to promote uh, disability, DRR, true research, and, you know, there's something that we can see and we can give to government to do. Thank you so much. Uh, Joanna, do you have anybody else uh, from the special invited guests wanting to speak? Uh, yes, we have Timothy who would like to take the floor. I have given him uh, permission okay. to speak. Thank Timothy. you. Please proceed, uh, Timothy. Or, um, or maybe Ms. Or Anil, if you would like to take the floor, since I think Timothy is not with us. Hello, is this over to me now? Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks to the organizers and for allowing me to, to, to be part of this. Uh, my, my name is Anil Pokhrel and I'm the chief executive of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management of 3D. Please allow me to speak slow so that it can be again integrated. Uh, my, my submission is, is threefold. Number one, uh, the focus is, is at times in terms of communicating the messages to persons with disabilities. But to reach there, we need to start with three other things that are equally important. Number one is on the data system. Uh, if we are able to, again, get a down to a household level geospatial data, part of a national information system to reach out the different categories of persons with disabilities, that will be of great value to do early warning systems. Number two is it has to be integrated to a multi-hazard risk assessment system. The risk assessment should also be accessible by persons with disabilities. Thirdly, in terms of communicating the systems for early warning systems, what we would need is a common alerting protocol that does address all hazards and all media targeting the persons with disabilities, different kinds of disabilities. And finally, uh, the response systems needs to be integrative of the needs of persons with disabilities, the infrastructures and the development work that goes behind uh, in, the, in, the, in the communities is critically important. So, so while the focus at times is only at communicating the message, what goes in behind the system is also equally important. This is, this is what I wanted to raise um, into in, in this platform and, and have it as a part of a discussion. I'll stop it over here, over to you, to the organizers. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I think, uh, uh, Jana, if it's okay with, do you have somebody else wanting to speak or else we'll turn to the participants? Yes, I believe Vashkar wanted to take the floor. We have okay. him. Vask Vaska, so you'll be the final uh, speaker. You have three minutes. Uh, we'll then go to the to the to the audience. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Vaskar Bhattacharjee. I am a person with visual disability from southern part of the uh, Bangladesh, and uh, we are working uh, almost last uh, two decades 
to make the disability inclusive disaster management. There is number of organizations, including CDD and uh, UNDP, et cetera, start working together to make uh, accessible information for persons with disabilities in terms of disaster. Uh, we are creating lots of accessible reading materials such as uh, full text, full audio, daisy extended multimedia talking books. We are using community media such as um, um, community radio, etc. And also we are trying to make all the web and e-service accessible for people with disabilities. Then they can easily access the information in, uh, when there is a disaster uh, related information so available for them. Um, now we are working for making a uh, accessible early warning system. Um, uh, we are working together to make it happen. And the issues is low literacy, affordability, and accessibility is a big barrier for persons with disabilities uh, in terms of disaster management. As a as a one of the more more most victimized country for climate change, regularly we are facing disaster here in Bangladesh, and I believe through the innovation and technology, we'll overcome the challenges. Uh, even though because of our two decades of three decades of work, we have a very inclusive policies, disaster management act, circulars and guidelines. Um, that is really making a positive impact for the people with disabilities in Bangladesh. As you know, Bangladesh already a model for a inclusive disaster management. Uh, we are trying and we are trying to involve the people with disabilities through different committees, including, you know, in a national committee, we have a women with disabilities. She's representing for, uh, on behalf of people with disabilities. We believe through all of your cooperations, we will become a model for other countries and other region and in our region. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Vasuka, and to our special invited guests for sharing uh, uh, your your experience, uh, adding to the rich uh, information being shared uh, by our panelists already. Um, uh, to, all, to our audience, our participants um, uh, from uh, all over the world, uh, you've been listening for now 15 minutes or so. Now it is your turn to ask um, the question uh, on this on, on, on this uh, platform. Um, you can also use the chat box uh, to uh, uh, to ask your questions uh, there as well. We are going to uh, 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 to, to take uh, Joanna uh, three questions first. Uh, we'll respond to those three questions uh, from our panelists. Uh, or, and our, the special guests uh, have those three questions answered, and then we'll take another three. We have about uh, half an hour, 30 minutes for this particular session. So please, if you want to ask a question, uh, do raise your hand, use the raise hand uh, facility in the Zoom uh, platform, and uh, Joanna will be able to identify you and then uh, uh, give you the floor to answer the, the, uh, ask a question. Uh, yes. The first three. Yes, I see Gulam Nabi online. We can first perhaps give him the floor. Yes, uh, Gulam Nabi, the floor is yours. Hello. Yes, please. May I yes. talk? Yes, please go ahead. Please welcome. Okay, so I was thinking that the climate change is very important for this purpose to develop capacity of DPOs about the climate change. Because of the climate change, the disasters have changed their shape. We have not, not so many indigenous disasters, but we are facing some new disasters like cloud busting and pandemic COVID-19 and such other disasters may be uh, come forward after the climate change. So person with disabilities need to be part of the process and their capacities may be developed for the climate change as they should be able 
to coop the new shapes of the disasters which are disturbing the humanity and especially person with disabilities thank you okay mr gulam nabi i uh, thank you for that question and statement um, so i'll be we we'll take the second question and uh, we 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 will ask our panelists if they can respond uh, to, uh, to to these three questions a second question you want please Dunya, do we have Timothy who raised the hand previously for us? Timothy, would you like to come in? All right, Seta, I propose because we have quite a few questions that have been asked already. Shall we turn to the panel members and see um, if there's anyone who would like to address any of the questions that have been asked? Seta, over to you. Okay, um, we are inviting the, 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 the panel uh, members to respond to the question being asked. Um, and, uh, and and also um, encouraging uh, our participants who uh, wish to ask a question. Uh, please have your question ready and be specific. The question will come to you after we respond to these questions that are here in front of us. I'll turn to the panelists uh, or the um, uh, our special guests uh, to respond to the question that's uh, uh, here with us uh, from uh, the question from uh, Gulam Nabi. I think there was on climate change and disability. Yeah, may I? Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I, I didn't know if you if you noticed uh, that I'm trying to raise my hands and just like that. So uh, thank you first of all very much, Gulam Nabi, for your interesting question uh, relating the climate and raising the climate change issue uh, concerning the uh, uh, change of uh, and augmentation of disasters that are happening worldwide and of course inclusion the inclusion of the uh, pe persons with disabilities in, into these processes uh, we must understand one thing uh, whatever, uh, and there were many interesting questions also in the question and uh, answers part that I was reading and trying to answer also, uh, which ask different types of questions, what we can do right now and how we should proceed. Uh, one thing that uh, I, I think about is there cannot be uh, prescriptions or recipes ready for any country or any specific moment. One thing that we must understand is that we live on the, on the earth, which is a living organism. And uh, it is evolving every day and every, every moment. And the societies are also living every day and evolving every moment. Of course, there are so many uh, hindrances, so many barriers, be it technological or be it uh, simple, just to the access to the very principal uh, possibilities and capabilities. Uh, I think the most important thing for the communities and the governments to interact is, is that exact interaction of keeping in focus the people, the persons uh, with disabilities who must not be left aside, that's the important thing, and to, 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 to keep it, to engage the dialogue together at any moment, as I said, at every certain moment. Otherwise, all our recipes will be old for the next few minutes. It, it can be helpful at that moment or maybe even not helpful, but we need these dialogues uh, free and uh, we need these dialogues uh, open uh, and also to try to tackle to many diverse issues and to ask and to listen. We need to ask the people, persons with disabilities and we need to listen to them what specific needs they do have at that particular moment. I think that's 
that's all about. Thank you very much for the question. I hope I tried to understand your, I, I tried to uh, answer to your question. Thank you, over. Okay, uh, any other panelists uh, or uh, our invited uh, guests would like to respond to the question? Thank you, Seth. Um, this uh, input in terms of, thank you for bringing up the context of uh, climate change also in your statement. As you know, the climate change for the Pacific region has brought super cyclones in the last five years across the Pacific region from Vanuatu. Uh, Fiji was hit by two uh, most recently. The, the, the sad thing in terms of uh, with um, information technology is that the one size fits all concept. One has to take into consideration also your target audience, the types of disability and how to ensure that the information that's coming is suited for all. And this is where the importance of the engagement of their representative organizations to be engaged in how the message is delivered, the context of the message. So that ensuring that the message actually is suited for every person, including persons with disability. And this is where the importance of OPD is coming to engage. Some of this is already happening, at national level. One thing that is, there's so much more that can be done. And it is important that those that work within the technology space also provide or come up with innovation to actually build the capacity of the OPDs so that that way they can ensure that while disseminating information and receiving information, how it's collated, how the speed of process can be done, how can information better reach, especially for those in the far to reach places and considering the different diversity of disabilities that's within these communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okanyasi for sharing the, the real experience, lived experience of person disabilities and climate change here in the Pacific. Um, Yuan, I wonder if there, uh, we turn to the audience again, we have about 20 minutes uh, left where we can um, entertain another round of questions from the participants. Yes, I believe we have Mr. Nazmul Abari. If uh, you can take the floor, please. Thank you very much. I hope I am audible to everyone. Uh, I just wanted to raise a few issues. Uh, I am from Bangladesh. I represent the Center for Disability in Development, CDG. I think uh, one of the very important factor is the lead time uh, that we have once we get the warning to act and you know be safe. And many times, you know, for persons with disabilities, and they're often the last to be you know supported or in the evacuation process after receiving the early warning sign now what happens is in the communities of uh, in in bangladesh and in the rural areas people are very much uh, you know wanting to save their assets uh, initially so if when we are talking about the early warning and if uh, it's not only the messages and the technology how it's being you know, accessible to all, but also we need to think, you know, how can we make the early warning system, you know, the way it's done so that there is a more lead time, uh, which will then contribute to the effective, uh, you know, the, the follow-up actions after early warning. That was one. Number two, to be very quickly, I think the capacity building, which has been highlighted is extremely important at the community level for persons with disabilities, self-help groups, you know, how do we, you know, uh, react in the uh, DRR uh, with regard to uh, early warning sign. And the third one, which has also slight raised, the multi-hazard uh, context. I think this is a reality now, you know, so many hazards coming at the same time, and that uh, this uh, early warning is uh, considering all for all people, all uh, different types of persons with disabilities, and the different intersectionality while we're thinking about this uh, cutting edge technology and early warning. Thank you very much for this opportunity and it's a great uh, session and dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Barry, for, uh, for those three questions. Lead time to early warning, capacity building and multi-hazards. Uh, please, uh, we'll be having a response from the panel uh, or special invited guests uh, 
uh, Joanna, do you have a second question from the floor? I think we can go ahead and proceed with the answers as we wait. If okay. Anybody... Thank you. Okay, uh, so back to you panelists uh, and uh, special uh, guests. And we would like to respond to um, to either of the three questions from Mr. Barry. Yeah, uh, Charudat here, may I, may I respond? Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so it was um, a very important and pertinent question has been raised. Uh, so, uh, so the one of the approaches which we have taken uh, to address uh, this, uh, see the, is how we could differentiate the 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 the, uh, the the first alert, which is a normal message or it's an SOS. So therefore, we divided SMS into three parts. Uh, the first is the 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 SOS where the message basically also gives that that conveys that it's 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 a something emergency. So the so so the 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 vibrations, the the special sounds like. Uh, ambulance or any sirens um, uh, uh, gets uh, uh, played first, number one. Number two, the messages, uh, which basically plays the, 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 uh, the very specific instructions uh, with an audio text and the screensaver. So which will be all different disabilities could be taken, uh, uh, could be uh, uh, understand those messages, depend upon their own preferences and what limitations they have and how they would like to get those messages. And the third one is, once they, they received the message, it is very important to ensure that they understood that. So that feedback from the from the individual is very important. So that you know that, that acceptance of that message and all this has to happen through through you know the the, the force, forcible methodology. So therefore, the the sim based application, which basically completely controls the mobile and doesn't allow you to do anything else, till you read the message or accept the message and confirm that message. And then the second part of the guided, uh, as, as they said that, you know, exactly what needs to be done at that point of time. So there should be a continuous communication should happen. So there will be a guided communication post that tracking mechanism, uh, uh, which takes care of, you know, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the support system, that safety mechanism to be uh, conveyed to him the the right uh, guidance message to be given to him also be has to be has to be taken care by the the solution itself till we reach reach out to the safety so uh, uh, so we need uh, the, the the different accommodations here and therefore the the, the one of the solution which we thought it is the affordable which could be sim based application integral part of a telecom uh, service provider sim application and could be invoked by government authorities and this kind of services to be provided with a tracking mechanism. So, so I wanted to answer the first part of the question. I hope I answered uh, that question. Can I invite uh, any other panel who wish to respond to this, uh, either of these three questions? Certainly jump in. Thank you, Mr. Yes, go ahead. Question and one key approach um, that we've been taking to address better preparedness and lead time is, a, is around improving partnerships between mobile operators who are designing these solutions, governments and humanitarian partners and ensuring that we have industry wide approaches. So one tangible way in which we've tried to improve this is by setting something up called the Humanitarian Connectivity Charter, which the GSMA set up in 2015. It's a set of three principles focusing on preparedness, scale and collaboration to really help to build the resilience of mobile operators to be more prepared ahead of disasters. And we have now um, over 100 mobile operators in over 100 countries who are signatories to the charter. And importantly, we also have humanitarian partners who are part of the charter as well. Um, over the years, we've held humanitarian connectivity charter workshops in various regions around the world to ensure that the types of preparedness that we that we take can be tailored to these specific contexts and the specific needs of people who are living in those contexts. Um, so, of course, as I mentioned before, 
I think that human centered design is a, is a key approach to embed into um, something like the humanitarian connectivity charter where we're really working in partnership with people with disabilities at the center of the approach, but also ensuring that there is dialogue um, and space for these forums between mobile operators, governments and humanitarian partners. Um, so we're taking some some steps towards addressing this, but I think it's a really good question and hopefully we've made some progress um, over the years. Um, but yeah, thank you again for the question. May I add a few things? Yeah, please go ahead. Very quickly, uh, only three things that I wanna uh, highlight here. The first one is generally what happened, the, the issue of persons with disability has been taken separately. For instance, uh, for this kind of meeting and webinar, definitely uh, maximum accessibility features are generally have tried to be provided. But uh, we, we are not trying to provide all, um, uh, similar uh, features to other events that even same agencies are even um, organizing. The second one is, uh, that's why I, I wanna highlight on the integration of those issues into the um, uh, similar or, or other programs uh, so that we can get all the things from the mainstream programs. Then second one is the database. I should not, uh, I would not go um, uh, so much about it as, uh, I think Anil Pokrel uh, had already highlighted so much about those things. Definitely, if we do have an uh, uh, inclusive database, definitely, even if uh, our technology would not uh, just work properly, uh, even specific dedicated uh, volunteers and uh, other community people can directly support uh, 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 to that situation, even persons with disabilities are, uh, are uh, last to be evacuated. Then, um, uh, I think um, then third and final thing from my side would be generally what happens regarding the uh, uh, physical and uh, digital accessibility of different infrastructure and communication services. Generally, we are focusing on a regular type of services. For instance, uh, nowadays, uh, we some, somehow are focusing on uh, general um, uh, accessibility of general infrastructure and services, but those agencies who have already built the accessible routes, at least to the uh, built environment and communication uh, built environment, even would not uh, would, would lack the uh, accessible uh, exit routes, uh, so so that persons with disability cannot escape from there. That that would be the situation. That's why even we have to focus on that particular situation. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, wonderful responses from the uh, the panelists, and also thank uh, the thanks to uh, audience for asking the question. Uh, you wanna? I probably can take one more question from the floor if there's uh, any. We have uh, one more from the floor. I will uh, okay. give the floor to Jawid. Jawid, please. Hello? Yes, yes, we Please ask a question. Please. Am I audible to you? Yes, yes. Uh, this is Fatma Jaffrey, and uh, I am uh, from Disabled Welfare Association. Uh, my disability is polio, and I am the women coordinator. And uh, in Pakistan, there are many areas which are remote and which are prone to disasters like floods and earthquake. In, in Pakistan, we have uh, this big problem that we don't trust on our agencies which give us the warning for the disaster, flood warning or the earthquake warning. People don't believe on it. And the evacuation process became very late and we delay. Even normal people having no disability, they don't believe on the news or on their agencies and they believe uh, until I I think we've lost uh... Uh, Jawit, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm around. Yes, please so, continue. Thank you. Uh, yes, so so this is uh, uh, 
Uh, my concern uh, uh, from uh, Pakistan, from all four or five provinces, uh, all the remote areas, the people are not reluctant to evacuate or li listen or believe the agencies of the disaster. So the people, healthy people having no disability, they delay so uh, uh, much and until and unless they see the sign of the disaster, they are not ready to evacuate. So that's why in, but whenever there's a disaster of flood, the earthquake, you must uh, uh, call the Pakistan disaster of earthquake in 2005, you know, the massive uh, uh, lives of, it was fatal. So many uh, lives could be saved, but we couldn't save because of the lack of preparedness. So this is the problem that awareness and advocacy we need to do for our remote areas and people. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joanna, do we have uh, another question from the floor? From the I participants? I think we're good on the floor, but Iana, she wanted to raise some questions from the uh, question and answer box. Please, yes, yes, please, sir. Thank please. you, Sheta. Thank you, Dunya. I just wanted to raise three questions that were asked in the Q&A box. Nino, myself, and the panel members have been busy responding to many of the questions. However, we have two questions for uh, Charu. So let me uh, read them to you, Charu, and hopefully you can come in with an answer. And then we have a third question, which is addressed to the entire panel member. Um, and I think it's a very interesting question. So I'm going to read it as well, and then any of the panel members can come in and respond. So first of all, the two questions for Charu are the following. What would you advise the owners of office buildings, any additional considerations for the people with disabilities for using the features you described? And the second question to Charu, is there a scenario where as a person with disabilities cannot reach during disasters because of mobility, mobility application does not function at the moment? If so, what is the alternative to reach this person? So Charu, these are the two questions to you. And the last question, the third question that can be addressed by any of the panel members is the following. What would be your top recommendations that need to be included into national and local DRR strategies or policies to ensure that technologies for disability inclusive early warning and preparedness can be realistically implemented in low resource countries and communities, especially considering the challenges in these countries and communities. So with this data, I'll turn over to you to address the panel. Thank you. Okay, uh, Charut, can I have your, your response to your two questions, uh, please? Yeah, uh, th thank you, thank you. So to respond to the first question where, uh, uh, in in a in a control environment or a building environment, what the the authorities are to be done? So here um, we have proposed an indoor positioning system, which primarily assist any user to to get a directional assistance to move from one point to another point. We would basically like to extend this this particular technology to solve the problem of emergency evacuation. So the the thing um, in the in the buildings on the you know in the, the buildings like malls the the airports railway stations has to install or basically adopt an indoor positioning system where GPS doesn't work uh, 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 effectively and then use that core capabilities of an indoor positioning system to apply to to solve the problem of uh, the uh, uh, the the emergency evacuation because we are able to track the user. A user and because it's a mobile based application we know the persona we know the disability uh, we know the, the limitations and then the, the the from alert to guided message to, to taking to the safety zone uh, the entire process could be adopted at per the need of that persona so this is what so what is basically the authority and the building authorities has to adopt is the to have an, an indoor positioning system available in the system this to address the second question where the 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 the, the, the mobile uh, 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 connectivity is not important not available 
so uh, so uh, so when we are talking about a mobile application here we are not talking about an internet based mobile application um and uh, we know that you know the, the the mobile penetrations are there even in the in the in the uh, uh, the remote areas today uh, uh, today and this uh, uh, the 80% of the population or more than 80% of the population use and uh, the 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 uh, uh, mobile network number 2 uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, connectivity uh, 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 connectivity uh, to the mobile application to disaster management and any other other solutions which basically involved into this is a key aspect so this entire solution which we have proposed is an is an public private partnership where all authorities all the systems works together complement each other uh, to provide the system so if a mobile mobile internet based mobile application is not available still with an service providers with an sim based application we could still pro provide the uh, the uh, the, uh, the 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 emergency alerts early alerts and provide him the guidance to to uh, to, uh, to to him and the surrounding people who could basically come and provide him the the support to take it to the safety so this is the core concept of this this approach which which uh, we have taken um, uh, in in solving this problem uh, uh, problem I thank hope you, I answered both. You, thank you very much for those um, excellent response. I will turn to the question uh, for to the other panelists. Uh, not sure whether um, you want. I need to read the question again quickly for them. Absolutely, Seta. So let me repeat that question. What would be your top recommendations that need to be included into national and local DRR strategies or policies to ensure that technologies for disabled, disability inclusive early warning and preparedness can be realistically implemented in low resource countries and communities. Over to the panel. Okay, panelists, any response from uh, any of you? Uh, thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, from, from my perspective on uh, the question on policies, um, it is very, very important that um, there's collaboration. Collaboration uh, to those that are your target audience, not only for persons with disability, uh, for you have to look at also gender, for women, in terms of their perspectives. Because you also have within the disability community different needs also according to gender. And to also uh, the, the question overall. Uh, addresses the, the other questions uh, that came earlier in terms of cap the confidence and capacity of persons with disability to actually move. Um, and the resourcing are in terms of as far as technology is concerned, one thing that is also crucial and important is that you can have the best state of that information technology to inform in terms of preparedness for a disaster. But if the resources in terms of where you evacuated to where the shelter is provided is not accessible to persons with disability, it almost defeats the purpose because persons with disability may not have the confidence to then move. Uh, in the Pacific region, this is often very true where persons with disability are don't move to evacuation center because of the inaccessibility and lack of support systems within the evacuation centers. They often move to families to other families who are in other safety areas. So for example, if it's in a flood, they go from where they are to another family member who's on, on high land. Because the policies within the policy and the structure system is to ensure that all persons with disability, to be included of persons with disability, the support system should be available to all. Currently for many persons with disability who are not evacuated evacuation centers, miss out on the support systems that post disaster, that is provided to those that are impacted and affected by the disaster is because the individual was not at the vacation centers, does not receive the location in terms of food rations that's been provided, and then becomes a burden to the family they go to. So the engagement of persons with disability or their representative organizations in the construction of what the policy and what the framework should entail, at the same time in terms of design, the development of the technology and the early warning systems that is made available should always in, ensure that it is person-centered like the whole process of this evening's 
uh, discussion. Further to that is it is important is that even for ensuring that there's resources available to provide that backup support in these areas. And as for persons with disability, there's a lot of need in terms of awareness as our colleague and our friend that has mentioned uh, from those that do not adhere because they do not believe uh, in the systems. So one is making awareness. So within the policy and the framework, it has to be a collaboration amongst the supplier, amongst the recipients of the information, the target population, and also Mr. from Wakanyashi, those that are creators. If you can uh, round up your point. Thank you, I'm there. Sorry. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we, we are 10 minutes away from, uh, from uh, time and uh, we are about to close. Uh, I'm just wondering if there was any other panelists who would like to sneak in a, a very short comment, like a one minute comment and respond to that question. But any I of the other panelists? Armin, sorry, I think we have Armin and Jenny to provide very okay. quick responses to the Okay, question. please, please. Well, I will keep very short, uh, sorry for jumping in, but this is a very important question raised uh, concerning the inclusion uh, or recommendations for national and local DRR strategies for exactly low resource countries. And therefore I just uh, emphasize the most important uh, topics uh, as uh, suggested by Sendai framework, uh, it is really important. The creation of uh, databases for the persons with uh, disabilities, this is uh, for uh, understanding the risk and also all the inclusive society, all of the, all of the approaches which are important. Awareness raising campaigns, as it was mentioned for Pakistan, if I'm not um, mistaken that not only Pakistan, but in also many countries that are um, uh, low resource countries, the people in the remote area don't believe and this is the lack of aware awareness raising campaigns and so on, the work with the community. Um, the uh, inclusion I mentioned, uh, a very important thing to include in the national and local level DRR strategies is the points for public-private partnerships and uh, com communication and partnerships with the organizations for persons with disabilities and various NGOs. So uh, these were my uh, important topics to, to raise here. So, uh, thank you. I can jump in very quickly if we have time. Um, so I think I would say the key things in terms of top recommendations are ensure that there is better data and co-define challenges and solutions with persons with disabilities. Technology that can be effective for people with disabilities doesn't need to be high tech. And in much of our work in the Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation Programme at the GSMA, we found that basic technologies can be hugely impactful. So we need to design technologies collaboratively that meet the needs and capacities of people who need them the most and use human centered design approaches to do this by putting people at the center of identifying the challenges and solutions. One small example is using instant voice recognition that works on a basic phone and it can be a really useful way um, for people with visual impairments to receive emergency alerts. So ultimately, as I said previously, I think the success of digital services will depend on who gets to define the problem and build the solution. Thanks. Uh, may I go quickly for a few? Hello, may I audible? Yes, yes, please. Hello. Uh, Can we go ahead? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, very quickly, uh, as yes. I must, uh, I'm so much concerned with the attitude and the, even the strategy for making the strategy and policies. That's why I wanna uh, focus on two, two to three things here. Uh, definitely, uh, most of the strategies at local and national level are not just recognizing uh, persons with disabilities as active contributor in different uh, countries. And mostly they are only dealing with the impairments or not, not with the barriers. That, that thing should be addressed while uh, formulating the strategies. Then for strategy, uh, another thing 
uh, of part, pa partnership would be another most important thing. <laughs> then addressing the uh, disability specific needs and capacities of OPD would be uh, the, another uh, aspects of strategies. Then uh, next one is the system um, should uh, mostly address uh, which are quite available um, resources at community or local level. Otherwise, that would not be uh, possible to address uh, the needs of uh, and, and, and usefulness of those particular technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, what's left for me now then is to uh, give all of you a huge thanks on behalf of the organizers, the UNDP uh, Development Dialogue Series, uh, Change Makers in Action, Cutting Edge Technology, for disability inclusive, early warning and preparedness. So I want to thank again all the, the um, panelists for your excellent uh, contribution to our special guests and to the questions that have come up from the floor. We will be putting together a report, an event report and a question and answers as well as a video recording, uh, which will be made available online. And now uh, to do a closing remarks, I will now uh, invite Mr. Ronald Jackson, Head Disaster, Risk Reduction and Recovery, Resilience Bureau, uh, UNDP. Uh, Jackson, the floor is yours and uh, you may close our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, sir, moderator. And special thanks to you for excellent moderation. I mean, the, the session ran on time. I want to thank the speakers themselves um, for also, you know, managing the time, but at the same time, delivering what I thought was valuable input to the dialogue. Um, it was an extremely rich dialogue. I, I struggled myself to take notes of all of the fantastic uh, perspectives provided, but also, you know, key recommendations. It's good when you can hear a conversation that not only identifies the challenges, but really articulate some, some, some tangible solutions as to how we can, we can really address some of the issues there. I want to, to just quickly highlight um, some, some key takeaways. Um, there were many, but I will, I will pick up a few of them. Uh, you know, the, the fact that there are various technology options emerging and, and which we can, we can you know, engage to, to really address this issue of warning. Um, the, point about the differently abled in our societies as, as key stakeholders in the process and should not be left out of the, the conversation around how we, how we design. Noting that there are progress, um, there's been progress over the years, but there still remains um, a significant journey in reaching people with diverse disabilities. Um, the points about attitudinal barriers, which we also have to, to, to get across. So it's not only the technology, but also looking at attitudes that we have to change. Understanding risk and vulnerabilities, the importance of disaggregated data. So it's, it, it comes across in every sphere. Um, it's certainly something we have, to, we have to work to improve. Looking at co-designing solutions, um, again, linking back to this idea that um, or differently abled members of our societies are part of a process and should be engaged in the co-creation um, uh, journey ahead. And of course, I, I, I found this quote from Bimal, um, very interesting. In fact, I also tweeted it, Bimal, if, if you don't mind, the accessibility paradox, um, you know, very interesting. So access due to affordability, access due to restrictions, um, maybe based on the context we're in, whether it is you're in a refugee situation, et cetera, access due to connectivity and, and the importance certainly of ensuring that we're including individuals in all phases necessary as part of addressing some of those access issues. Um, the partnerships, key partnerships with the private sector, public sector, civil society, um, and more importantly, um, the differently abled as active contributors in the process. So um, I, I want to just quickly close by saying um, this was tremendous. UNDP uh, remains committed. Uh, we will continue our efforts to promote accessibility, um, universal design and innovation in disability inclusive programming that play an important role in fulfilling UNDP's mission in achieving the sustainable development goals. Then the UN Convention on the Rights 
of persons with disabilities. We will play a role in the UN, we will continue to play a role in the UN development system as a unique and privileged convener of stakeholders representing a wide and varied set of interests, competences, and domains to promote disability inclusion agenda. We will promote a rights-based approach and the co-creation role of the people with disabilities in all development interventions. We promote the active involvement of persons with disabilities and their representative organizations as co-creators and partners in the development initiatives. And there have been several um, within the life of UNDP so far and remain committed to that process, particularly in disaster risk reduction, where we have strengthened mechanisms for the effective participation of persons with disabilities in decision-making and implementation of disaster risk reduction and recovery interventions, early warning systems, and information sharing. And we have, like, for example, our tsunami preparedness program in Asia Pacific and in Fiji. Uh, we have capacity building for persons with disabilities and their representative organizations to raise their awareness. And you can see, for example, our DX4 Resilience Project, which was carried out in Philippines and Sri Lanka. And of course, the work we have done in terms of maintaining relevant information for local and diverse disability um, in, in Asia Pacific as well. Uh, I want to just indicate that the outstanding advances in technology and collective intelligence can foster innovation ecosystems that promote inclusive technologies by and for persons with disabilities. And UNDP has an opportunity to pilot and scale up innovative solutions in partnership with technology providers, persons with disabilities, and grassroots organizations. We commit to raising the standards of, its, of our performance on disability inclusion and to bring about unified, transformative, and lasting change for persons with disabilities. I want to close by reminding that the session transcript, along with the questions, answers, and reflections shared in the chat box, will be released after the event and shared with all participants who, part, who participated in today's event. So please make your voices heard in writing in case interactive discussions did not allow for all to contribute. All your questions will be, will be addressed and shared with you. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to all of our partners across the region and, and representatives who tuned in. Uh, thoroughly en enjoyed the engagement. Have a great rest of the week.